Hello everyone and welcome for another video of Love and War Games. In this video, we will take a look at the Thule Bellfleet set and make a little what to build guide uh, to see which are your options and how you should play them. Uh, we recently remade some uh, what to build with the Alexeyev and apparently like uh, the new format is quite enjoyed so we will continue using this new format of presentation for the units but feel free to let us know what you would like to change etc. Here we will really spend quite some time on each different unit to see how they can be played and if you like this give us a thumbs up. You can also give us um, a little comment and if you do leave us a comment and then you will gain some chance to earn an entire Commonwealth battle fleet or an entire uh, Black Wolf battle fleet. It's actually the same, but it allows me to say it twice. Uh, it's just the same miniatures, quite a lot, and uh, you can play them either as Russian, either as mercenary. So always useful. Okay, without further ado, let's talk a little bit about the Covenant, uh, because they're quite a tricky faction, and I would even go as far as saying they are the trickiest faction in the game. Uh, not in the sense that they are uh, have the most shenanigans. Uh, that would probably be the Sultanate, but the Covenant have only exotic weapons, they don't use the basic weapons of other nations, so all their weapons have weird names, you're not sure sometimes what they do, and it does take some practicing with them to understand uh, what punch is good, what is resilient, what is not, because they have a lot of rules that can pile on top of each other. Uh, in the end, they are quite balanced, but they play quite differently, like their defense is not the same, they have lower armor, but they have uh, more defensive track to counter the enemy shots, etc. Uh, usually, what you can say in general is that their ships are more more fragile for their point cost. Uh, these guys are no Russians, so you will need to make sure that they get to do what they are supposed to do before they get shot down. Because be sure that any dedicated amount of firepower will overpass the little defensive shenanigans of the Covenant and will sink your ships. And since all of your ships are expensive, eh, then yeah, need to be careful. Uh, they're usually, usually the best at the point blank range. That's where most of the Covenant uh, ships want to be because that's where the exotic like particle weapon and pulse meters and stuff work best. Some of their units are very good at extreme range, and but that's more like the exception than the rule. Uh, and they also play very well the SRS game. They can really send a lot of SRS, uh, quite cheap for the point cost and they are harder to destroy, but uh, they don't get weight of fire. So lots of little specificities for the airships of the Covenant, we'll, which we will see here. They're really much more on the glass cannon side of the Covenant. Uh, you will be able to reinforce them a little bit uh, if you get a Diadella specifically, like a surface ship that is not in the box. Uh, we'll talk about it and how to explain at the end, but yeah. Just consider them as fragile. They may look tough when you look at them, but they do melt fast against dedicated firepower for their point cost. And all right, what do you get in this box? First of all, it's a box at 60 pound and you do get quite a few sprues of plastic. You get, I think five sprues if I'm not mistaken, or yeah, some four or five sprues. And um, what do you get in, a, in this? First of all, you get to build a Thule Sky Fortress Saucer. Uh, which is this giant ship here looking a lot like the silent base star of uh, Battlestar Galactica and uh, I've, I've seen it uh, recently uh, on the table for a battle report that will take some time to be created as a video so you will see it in a little bit but yeah this thing is really huge like uh, it takes a lot of space and it does deserve to be classified as a mass 5 plus it's a really powerful ship and it's really the heart of this set as you have seen in our unboxing video uh, to build the tool, you actually just take uh, two sprues of these uh, heavy saucers that can be the Adamski, etc., and you just link them together in the center, and it gives you this uh, giant battle star. So yeah, quite uh, quite cool thing. Uh, right there and I love the model. You can of course then build them as um, the heavy saucers themselves, the Adamski, the Honebu or the Valtar, uh, those that you can see here. And those are um, quite interesting. They are very much the glass cannon of the faction. They can be very, very effective, but again, they are difficult to hide and they do melt fast. Like, uh, they, they don't have enough armor and citadel and stuff to be considered uh, tough ships at all, as we will see. But if they get in their perfect range, damn, are you going for hurt? 
And finally, you get six light sorcerers. It's not their exact name, but I just tried to make a difference. And uh, those can be built either as Euclids, which are the like punchy version. Uh, those things uh, pack a ton of punch. Like uh, we've tried them in this uh, latest battle report that you will see in a while, and uh, those just obliterate anything. I tried to counter them with some mess ones of my own, and they just obliterated their mess ones with while suffering very little damage uh, back. They are just very efficient, but they need to be in point blank. And then you get the Pythias, which are extremely cheap aircraft carrier. Uh, the concept of fl small flying saucer aircraft carrier is already cool, and they're really good for what they do. For their point cost, uh, you will never be wrong with adding a few Pythias in your box. So, as you can see, they're really like you want to play everything, so there is nothing to throw in this box. Uh, depend on how you want to do uh, with this. Do you want a full aerial fleet? Do you just want one specific unit of aerial to uh, support your Covenant ships? Uh, all those works. And of course, you get six SRS tokens because, as we've uh, talked, the Thule is an aircraft carrier, the Pythaeus are aircraft carrier, so you can really send a lot of tokens. Okay, well, let's start with the Thule. Uh, this thing, like, wow. <laughs> The big thing to keep into consideration is that it is 350 points, which is huge. And do remember that because yes, it is powerful, yes, it is difficult to shoot down, but for the point cost, it is not that resilient. Especially Armor 6, Citadel 13, uh, it's quite low, but especially arm, uh, Armor 6 means that if your opponent gets to make a lot of firepower on this guy, he can start to pile up the damages very fast and it can be crippled surprisingly fast. So it is a very good aircraft carrier. It has SRS capacity of 8, very good. Uh, it has flag barrage 12, so good luck <laughs> destroying it with your own uh, aircrafts, especially since it has ADV of uh, 7. So it is a good ship at far, from far away. It has luminiferous defenses at 4, and it has also a shield generator, which the shield, you will be able to boost it with the diadel surround, and you can repair it. So really, it can be a tough cookie if you keep it uh, far away from the enemy at your good range and you use all its firepower. But be very careful that this thing, it really can be sunk fast if you get too close to the enemy and they get to shoot very fast. We had uh, some arc weapons focused on this guy, so ignoring the shield, and it, you will see, but it, it can be crippled fast if you play too offensively. So be careful about that. Uh, something else to consider about this uh, little guy is that it is bristling with, with weapons. It is, of course, not only uh, an aircraft carrier, otherwise it would be like, a, like the Avalon, quite underwhelming. Now, this guy has X-ray laser banks. These things at point blank will obliterate anything. Uh, so if the enemy gets close or you it's like turn 3, turn 4, you get a little bit more aggressive. These things are going to be very powerful. You also have a heavy particle cannon, which is always great. I would maybe consider upgrading to the Sturgeon atomizer for only five points it's not going to be that much of a difference and um, what, since you can cannot link with other units i would say that usually i prefer to have a sturgenium atomizer and point it at the right target than having a single heavy particle can so your call there are lots of different weapons will not go too much in details but that would be my tip and then you have heavy etheric broadsides, a little bit of everywhere. Uh, this should be considered more like a last resort uh, weapon because they're not that uh, powerful. And if you are at point blank with this guy, uh, you do have X-rays and stuff. But it means that uh, probably it will not live too long. So don't. The big mistake would be to throw the full uh, headlong on your opponent, thinking it is invincible and wanting to use the X-ray laser banks and the broadsides. Uh, no, keep it covered, keep it in the back, let it use its flag barrage and its SRS and uh, be an uh, anchor for your fleet and don't throw it as a missile. Though, if you do get close to the opponent, one thing you could do would be to go around. It does not have a vulnerable stern, so show them your aft, uh, plus you are agile, so it can, can work, especially it has a turn of 10, so you can really turn hard. And uh, so, yeah, as soon as the enemy gets a little bit close, show them your back and throw them the electrostatic vacuum bombs, which are very powerful. And um, that would be how I would play it. Uh, the fool. Get a little bit close to the enemy, send your SRS, do your thing, uh, use your Sturgeonium Atomizer. And when the enemy gets closed, turn around, use your X-ray laser banks, of course, your broadsides and your electrostatic vacuum bombs as you go away from the enemy and stay at your good range and uh, don't rush in the middle of the enemy fleet. And you, the, you will find that the fool really pays back for its points.
plus it has a free value of 10 with alien cohort so on i would say more often than not you should also try to board uh, with the extra range of six inches from the alien cohort uh, it will be good uh, then we go for a very interesting ship i want to love it and i'm not sure i do uh, it's the adamski strike saucer so this guy this guy is fast uh, it has some unique things. We will talk about the, all the heavy saucers at once. You can build only one of those uh, with this box, except if you decide not to build the Thule, in which case you can make three. Uh, this thing has armor 5, <laughs> Citadel 11. So it looks like it will melt like paper under enemy firepower. And spoiler, yes it will. Uh, it does have Luminiferous Defense 4, so you get 4 uh, rolls of defense against many weapons, and Shield Generator. So it means that you do need dedicated firepower or it will just bounce off of him. But if the enemy does get some dedicated firepower pointed at these guys and the other sorcerers, which have similar stat line, then the Adamski is for sure going to go down very fast. The things that are interesting with him is, first of all, it has a low level strike, which means it can deploy as a skimming unit, so not in the very beginning of the game, and it can be hidden behind islands, always uh, nice. And it has a very specific rule that is quite interesting, which is the interface navigator. Uh, this means that at the end of the turn, you put a token and then it can appear uh, anywhere within 20 inches of any interface marker. It works a little bit like that for the uh, Empire with their like phase uh, generator. Uh, but the big difference is that the Adamski does not shoot at Cripple uh, when he appears back. So that means that you can really get uh, a couple of Adamskis at point blank very fast using their etheric broadsides and X-ray laser banks uh, like immediately at a full effect. And this is going to be a really, really powerful uh, tool. However, it is fragile, very fragile. It is like a very much a glass cannon, uh, especially since you want to be at point blank with all your weapons. And I don't know, it's, it sounds best suited on the flank because it's going to be very fast. It can go uh, attacking your weaker, the, your opponent's weaker units, uh, like flankers, like, uh, for example, destroyers that uh, have small gun batteries will hate this because uh, the IELs are always considered to be one range further. So he's very good at hunting mass one, hunting destroyers, hunting smaller ships. But if your opponent uh, puts the big guns on him, uh, is going to go really bad for you. So, uh, something to try with the Adamski. Uh, all the heavy saucers have their customization parts on the bottom, so you can always proxy it as one or the other. Like, I challenge your opponent to uh, recognize which model it is just by looking under, especially if your opponent is not a Covenant player. So, you, you can choose from one game to the other on what you want to play them as. And this is very good, as I said, to very fast go on your, your opponent's weak flank destroy the enemy's flankers and then go behind very fast like end of turn 2 or beginning of turn 3 you can really be like hovering over your enemy uh, ca uh, carriers for example and this is where you want your Adamskis to be let's continue with the Valtar which is a little bit like an upgrade let's say at 155 points and this might be my favorite version I <laughs> jury still out on this one but it is you do pay more, but it does get a lot. <laughs> and by a lot, I mean it gets a heavy particle cannon, already great. And you can upgrade this particle cannon with a Sturgenium Atomizer or the other weapons. If you buy only one Valtar, I would say maybe use it as a Sturgenium Atomizer. But if you get a squadron of two of those, then uh, I would say get them the um, keep uh, the heavy particle cannon. Because you see they have the rule across the beams, which means you can use heavy firepower on those guys to really make one big punch. And uh, yeah, I think uh, two Valtars is probably what I'm going to go with, with my uh, few boxes. And um, those guys also are fragile, as you can see from the stat line. But they are more comfortable staying just on the edge of uh, the enemy's like 20 inches range to really shoot as much as they can with their particle cannons or atomizers and stuff. Uh, they do have shields and luminiferous defenses and everything. Uh, most of the time they will be counted as being uh, 
like long range for your opponent so unless they have specific weapons to deal with them it's going to be hard they have full steam ahead so on the first turn like if you want to get close to the enemy they can be speed 13 that is going to be huge they have turn uh, 10 for later on to go around and not be in the range of the opponent and uh, yeah i think i really like those guys for 150 points and they're definitely uh, something that I would consider if I were you as a central skirmisher, like staying 20 inches away from the enemy and then uh, falling back and being annoying to deal with between the shield and the luminiferous defenses and being at long range uh, for your opponent. And the very last one, and this one I also want to love, and uh, I think it's really like they're the same point cost as with the Valtar, and I understand uh, why they are very similar. Uh, the big difference between the Honebu and the Valtar, I hope I pronounced these names right, uh, is that uh, this Honebu does not have cross the beams, so no point in having two heavy particle cannons, but it's fine, you can have two Sturgeonium Atomizer if you build two of those. Um, and they do not have full steam ahead, so it will be a little bit longer to get closer to the opponent, but this is the ship that maybe you could consider making a turbo encabulation drive if you feel risky, and especially if you have a Zoomina in your fleet. They uh, are, they do have alien cohort, which will boost their fray, but at fray 7, which means fray 9 when there is two of those, uh, yeah, I wouldn't count on that like at all. There are landing vessels. Uh, at mass 3, this is quite significant because you can drop six tokens on an island. We don't have the rules yet, but more tokens is better, I'm guessing. And uh, yeah, there are not that many mass 3 uh, landing ships, especially at that point cost. And they have strategic withdrawal, which is terrible because they have no way of uh, getting back on the table. But uh, I don't know, if you're really getting charged by, I, I don't know, something that will kill you next turn, uh, maybe, okay, use strategic withdrawal and try to come back later. I, I would really only use this uh, at the last resort, strategic withdrawal, and maybe even try a turbo encabulation drive instead. The big thing that makes me want to try the Honebu, because you see that they lose a lot and they don't gain much, especially right now while we don't have landing rules, is that they have an electrostatic vacuum bomb. And then you can do kind of like the same thing as we said for the Thule, which is you stay at 20 inches, you shoot at them with Turgenium atomizers, uh, and then with your incredible turn 10, you just turn around, show them your back, and throw them some electrostatic bombs uh, on top of the uh, atomizer and broadsides and X-ray laser banks. Uh, that is how I would play them. Uh, they would go very well, now, now that I'm thinking about it, alongside the Thule. Like just one pack that does the same thing. Be careful of Blast Templates, of course, if you do that. But yeah, then you have <clears throat> one Thule and one Honebu, for example, doing exactly the same maneuver. And uh, yeah, they should, uh, they should be efficient. So yeah, something to try. Uh, depends on your playstyle. Adamski are good for flanking and being very fast in your opponent's back. Uh, the uh, Onebu are going to want to have Turbo Incubulation Drive or being maybe in strategic reserves to go at the right place and then pull back from the enemy. And the Valtars are a little bit in the, in the middle and more like skirmishers. And if you go the route of the Valtar, uh, do this because you take two of those and you can cross the beams. Okay, now we go for the mass once and we start with the Pythaeus Light Saucer. And this guy is a doozy. Uh, so it is an aerial, so also a long range. It is a mass one, so gunnery weapons are going to consider this guy as obscured. Quite uh, like it starts to be quite difficult to deal with him, especially since it also has a shield generator, which you can boost to shield generator of mass two with a Diadelus. Uh, <laughs> that starts to be annoying. It does not have luminiferous defenses, luckily for him. Uh, like <laughs> luckily for the balance of the, the game uh, and it has four hull points so if your enemy just barely makes damage on uh, them it's going to take quite a while to uh, destroy them and between the shield the fact that they are going to be most of the time at long range and uh, Citadel uh, 11 uh, and the fact that yeah they're, they're gonna be obscured against gunnery and everything it is going to take a while to destroy them usually you want to use torpedoes or this kind of thing against mass swans uh, because uh, they don't count as being obscured and everything. Uh, those guys are aerial, so they're immune to that. Uh, they're going to be vulnerable from other aerial, aerials. I'm especially thinking of the Imperium uh, Zeppelins, the mass one, that, which are absolutely insane currently, or some of the mass ones of the Crown... No, actually, they're bad. So, uh, but 
yeah, there are ways to counter those guys, but for 55, uh, 56 points per model uh, and SRS capacity of two, uh, that is actually a cheap uh, SRS that you can just keep on the side, like quite far away from the enemy. They're gonna throw it from far away. And uh, yeah, they're quite fine. And in the worst case, if you, they get it point blank, you can use their pulse broadside, but that's really not what you want to do with them. You just want them to be spread out to avoid the blast templates. A pack of four of those are gonna send eight SRS token, <laughs> basically as much as an, as an Avalon. And uh, they're gonna be so difficult to deal with. And uh, yeah, if the enemy does focus heavy firepower to destroy them, uh, which is what is needed, uh, then it's all the firepower that is not going on your other uh, models. So yeah, it's a win in any situation. Uh, the Pythaeus are probably the ships that I would consider uh, from the Thule battle fleet uh, in any uh, Covenant list. Like they just bring so much utility for such a low point that uh, yeah, you get six of those in the box. Uh, if you buy build a six Pythaeus, uh, it's absolutely fine to play them. And finally, the Euclid Light Saucers. Uh, those guys are very interesting as well, especially because they have a full power particle beamer, which you can replace for free for a pulse emitter. And having these guys with a pulse emitter uh, jumping on you with a turbo encabulation drive is <laughs> just going to be very stressful for your opponent. You can be cheeky and use them with forward deployment if you would like that. Um, but uh, that is quite risky, I would say, because uh, at point blank, uh, the enemy will have weapons to deal with them, um, even small gun batteries and all. So it's a difficult choice, but it's going to be a threat that your opponent has to deal with, absolutely. I'm more of a fan of either putting them in strategic reserves or even having a pack of six of those, uh, sorry, four of those, uh, and making a turbo encabulation drive with a Zomina around. That is probably. Uh, what I would do. They also have Hydrophone Relay, so it does push you also to use them with forward deployment, but I'm afraid that they would just be sunk very fast in this case, because they are aerial, you cannot hide them, and you need to deploy them early, so risky, risky. Uh, probably better to keep them in your line, and turn one very early, you make a turbo encabulation drive, and then you get your Hydrophone Relay on your own terms when you want, and especially you can jump in the back of your opponent if you're lucky, or you can just really be annoying and go where you want to go, and use your Pulse Meter at point blank, and four Pulse Meters at point blank, let me tell you, the opponent is not going to enjoy the joke. All right, so you built your Thule Battle Fleet, you played with those, and you want to expand a little bit. Uh, what should you get next? Uh, well, the most logical thing to go is the Icarus Battle Fleet set. Uh, that is the number one purchase that you uh, could do, because uh, you do get the Icarus, which is a great carrier, of course, but especially it can be built, this Covenant Support Battleship, as the Diadalus. And the Diadalus repairs your ships around, like your airships. Uh, it has advanced repair facilities, which is great. It does prevent your ships from dying on a counter, so it gives you like a 5 plus uh, chance to stay alive uh, when, you, uh, when you die. Especially great for your mass ones around you. If you have a, a horde of Pythaeus around, it's going to be great. And it boosts the shield also of any aerial units around himself. So really, the Diadalus is an amazing boost for any uh, Covenant airships. Even if you just have six, uh, sorry, four uh, Pythaeus or just uh, a Thule and an Adamski or anything, it's always going to be great to have a Diadalus with them. It's also a good ship which bring, brings a lot of utility that the Covenant loves. Uh, it's tough, like I, I would highly, highly recommend a Diadalus. Uh, then you also get some Covenant frontline cruisers, which are always good. Uh, there are different ways to build them. I will not go too much in details, but if you don't know, uh, the Lovelace is always going to be fine. Um, or you can build one Antarctica to make the Belgica, which is an inversion, quite fun for fluffy lists. It does quite funny stuff. You get six Covenant frigates. Uh, those are really, really efficient. You can build them with a lot of different uh, weaponries. Um, I will not go in detail, but they usually want to be at point blank, and they also want to make a turbo encapsulation drives or being in reserve. But those guys, at least, they can hide, so you can try to hide them behind islands while you get close to the opponent, and you get some SRS token as well. Then another very good uh, point would be the Covenant starter set at uh, 60 pounds. Uh, 60 pounds, sorry. Uh, 
this box brings you first of all the control ship uh, which is this uh, whale launching ship it's very very powerful uh, it's basically the true carrier of the covenant because most of their carriers are like battle carriers that are fine with being in the front line uh, no the control ship uh, the Descartes is not uh, it wants to stay hidden behind an island or something and send its SRS token safely so it, yeah it's the closest thing you will have to a carrier in the covenant fleet uh, but it is really really good and then you have the name version the Oedipus which is more for experienced player but it's the same frame the same model you just use it a little bit differently with some different weapons the Oedipus is really really good for boarding it can board with its uh, whales uh, it has very good point blank weapon as well uh, however it does not get the option to get the upgrade to launch uh, not whales but orcas and it means that it does not have the very long range uh, SRS capacity of the basic Descartes so a little trick here uh, but let's not make a full review of the whole pack you do get some Covenant support cruisers which are great you can have the Quintillion artillery ship great for for extreme range firepower while you the rest of your fleet gets closer or you can have the always efficient uh, Plinius carriers which is again a battle carrier let's call it uh, because it has a lot of weapon it's quite tough and it does launch SRS as well and you get the amazing Tacitus, which is a very powerful ship, uh, not as tough as it used to be, but it's still a very big threat that, that your opponent will have to deal with, and that is not as fragile as it looks. You get two Covenant Advanced Cruisers, all of those have very different uh, tricks that they can do, I will not go in detail, but I would say this one uh, Zumina variant that you can have, which uh, allows you to stabilize your turbo encabulation drives uh, through a Valor action now, yes, but it's really important, especially if you do count on making turn one important turbo encabulation drives on a big expensive unit, uh, it's quite important to have at least one Zumina. You also have two Covenant Assault Machines, these giant centipede uh, creatures. Uh, very good threat. Uh, they can be underwhelming sometimes, uh, but they are relatively cheap. Uh, do not consider them as, I don't know, the Imperium robots. They are cheaper and they are for sure not as lethal. Uh, they do get some good tricks, but they are not as powerful and faction defining as, uh, yeah, as the Oshmeister, for example. Not even as much as the Kostroma of the Commonwealth, but they are very good uh, annoying uh, flanking ships. Then you get the six Covenant submarines. Uh, you can either build them as uh, the ramming um, um, Praxillas, which I would not uh, recommend uh, a lot of the time, especially if you know you're going to have one fleet in uh, strategic reserves, which uh, their Praxillas really like. They do want to be in uh, strategic reserve most of the time. Or you can build them as Diogenes, and that's what I would recommend to you uh, right now, uh, to have some long range. Uh, ships that are again going to be underwater so submer uh, yeah, submerged so obscured against most weapons uh, they are quite tough for the point cost especially if you spread them out and uh, yeah they're just going to be very annoying to remove and any heavy firepower going their way is something that does not go on your big expensive class cannons you get some more SRS tokens and some escorts which are actually very beautiful for the covenant I love them uh, and you get some uh, orcas and fissiteer whales uh, tokens Finally, and I almost wanted to say, like, buy if you want to expand on the Thule, you can uh, buy another Thule Battle Fleet, which is a tip I will just give right now. But yeah, it's always going to be good if you want to make a pure aerial fleet or want some reinforcements. Uh, it's a very good deal, and I would recommend to buy a second Thule Battle Fleet rather than the Enlightened Aerial Squadron uh, because you get much more for your money for sure. And then you can choose to go with the Archimedes Battlefleet set, which is something that I would highly recommend, especially if you are not an existing uh, Covenant player and you already have some Dyson stuff because you get so much. So yes, it is £85, which is a lot, uh, I agree, but look at the list on the left, you get basically everything that you could want. Uh, the thing to know as well is that if you order through Myobi Place, uh, you do get 10% discount on your box, on any box that you buy, and you can also support the channel uh, either by going through the link in the description or just by choosing Love and War Games in the partners that you want to help while reviewing your cart. So thank you very much if you do that. Uh, with the Archimedes Battlefleet set, uh, you will get 
as you can see, uh, frontline cruisers, frigates, support cruisers, advanced cruisers, those assault machines, submarines, a ton of tokens, so basically everything that we talked already. And especially you get the Covenant Vault Ship, which is the closest thing that you will have to a battleship for now for the Covenant. Uh, those things, especially the basic um, Archimedes, are very good for going through the center of your fleet and just boosting everything. You have a named variant of the Archimedes, which is the Schneider, which is quite difficult to play, uh, like the Oedipus. It wants to be at point blank, but it's a little bit fragile, but it does a ton of damage uh, once it gets there, so a little bit trickier to play. Uh, you have another variant that is much easier to play, which is the Arcadian Storm, which trades off a little bit of utility for just raw firepower, which is always enjoyable. And uh, I would recommend the Arcadian Storm uh, for beginners um, to play for your first game with uh, an Archimedes. Or you can also have the Nansen Carrier, which is, I think, my favorite of the lot. Uh, first of all, it looks amazing, and it just does a little bit of everything. Uh, which is not something I usually recommend. I usually say like you should have a ship that does one thing clearly and then you can use it. But the Nansen is actually very good at everything. It's a good carrier. It's a good uh, battle carrier actually to, to shoot at the enemy. It has quite some rules to support the fleet. Uh, like it is a good ship and cheaper than the Archimedes and the others. So yeah, it always finds a place in my list for the Covenant. And that is it. I hope that you enjoyed the video and that you found it informative. If you did, please give us a thumbs up, it really helps. Uh, you can also give us a little comment, uh, first of all, to let us know what you think, what you would like us to cover next, if you like these what to builds, and also to gain the chance to enter this random determining of who will get a Commonwealth Battle Fleet. I will uh, do it early October to make sure who gains this Russian battle fleet. So be uh, hurry up and put a comment now if that is what you want to get. And uh, also, if you uh, were ever to buy your Dystopian Wars uh, model through Myobi Place, uh, do know that it helps a ton. Uh, a percentage is given back to the channel, and I get it back as a little ticket to invest back in the <laughs> in the website. So it means that I can buy more models uh, for Dystopian Wars to make larger battle reports for the future. So <laughs> that is how you can help uh, the channel. Thank you very much. Take care of yourself, and until the next video, do remember to keep spreading the love all around. Bye!